Now after that he was furious. And his anger was not at all pacified. And the biggest devotees came and offered prayers. And they offered prayers and not one of them was successful in pacifying the Lord. Rachel explained that Lord Narasimha Day, he was so angry because Prahlad had been threatened that he felt even the devotees were responsible. He says, you neither protect, protected Prahlad nor did you protest when he was being persecuted. So, because you remained silent, doing nothing, now you are coming and offering great praise to me. What is the use of it? So the Lord was not pacified by their prayers. He felt that they had failed in their duty. They were so angry. And after all they were done, right from Brahma to Indra to Shiva, all of them they tried, none of them could pacify the Lord. And even Lakshmi Devi, she said, I cannot, I cannot pacify him. He's so angry. So at that time, when everyone had failed, Brahmaji asked Prahlad, if you go there. And Prahlad went and offered obeisances to the Lord, fearlessly. And that Lord was roaring ferociously like a lion. Suddenly, he changed and started you know, purring like a cat, sweetly. Bless Prahlad Nagante. He can completely pacify. So that which no one else was able to do, Prahlad did. And now this, for a normal human being, this is the sign, this is the time for you know, exaltation. Now I did something which nobody else was able to do. And normally, you know, we would, most of us, we would be proud, yes. You know, most, how many people saw what I did? Nobody could do it. And Prahlad, small five-year-old boy, what is his consciousness? Although he succeeded in pacifying the Lord, he is seeing it not in the sense of achievement. He is seeing it in the sense of wonder. How could I do it to Lord? Kintosh to Madhate, Same Hari Rukrajate. Kintosh to how was it possible? How could it be that I could satisfy the Lord? So actually, devotees, if they are able to do something wonderful in Krishna's service, they don't feel proud. Oh, yes, see, what a wonderful thing I achieved. They feel amazed. How was I able to do that? How was I able to do that? So, Sri Prabhupada said that at times, that actually, even I was amazed, the success of the Krishna consciousness movement, the sheer magnitude of the success, Exceeded my expectation. I was also amazed at how much it's been. So Prabhupada himself worked so hard to do it. But it is Krishna on his kingdom. So the question that he raises in the first question, how is it possible, O Lord, for me to satisfy you when these devatas could not satisfy me? So his subsequent prayers are actually his exploration of the answer to this question, a question which has left him. Wonderstruck. Normally, if we achieve everything, our question is how many people are appreciating what I have done? <laughs> but his question is that how was I do it? I do it. Kim the wish to my day. So, the submission of a devotee is in that the devotee's focus is always on the Lord. It is not on oneself. The devotee is able to achieve something wonderful in Krishna's service. That the devotee does that. But the normal nature of the conditioned ego is that we are self centered. And we want to broadcast our own glories to the world. Once Shri Prabhupada was in Australia and there was one person who looked like a uh, some kind of a god man kind of person. You know, he was getting an elaborate cape like a superman and he had a big cap. And at the end of the class, he told Prabhupada, Swamiji, I am God and I want to prove it next month. Prabhupada said, That's all right. Everybody thinks like that. <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada is completely nonchalant about that. What does it mean? None of us may. Most people don't claim explicitly that I am God. 
But the underlying idea that I am great and people don't know my greatness. In the future, I'll prove my greatness to the world. But the idea is that now at one level, it's a normal human tendency. We all need, we all feel a human need for appreciation. But where we seek that appreciation, how we seek that appreciation, that is important. So Prala, even when he has achieved something with the Devutas have not achieved. Devutas failed to do. He does not think that you know, just see how great I am. He is going to, as his prayers will go forward, he will reveal that he sees his achievement not as a proof of his greatness. He sees his achievement as a proof of the Lord's greatness. That the Lord used even an instrument like him to do something like this. That instead of in the Lord doing something through anyone else, he could have done it through anyone else, but the Lord chose to do it through him. And that was his amazement. So he draws the contrast. And by contrast, he, he is establishing that actually I am inferior. That I am actually, they are in Sapruna, they are Devutas, I am in Tamaguna, I am born in Tamaguna family. What qualification do I have? So in Bhakti, Actually, the more we dwell on our glories, the less we can relish Krishna's glories. The more we are filled with ourselves, the less we can fill our heart with Krishna. So, Prahlad Maharaj, even when he has achieved something extraordinary, his mood is one of humble submission. My dear Lord, how could I have done it? He is himself now. Vachasam Prabhavai. In fact, all the devatas, they offer her prayers to just one or two verses. Now what happens is, they are offering prayers to pacify the Lord, but when they see that the prayers have no effect, they just stop. I don't know what to do. Sometimes somebody is angry and try to pacify that person, anger doesn't go, I just don't know what to do, just stop. So Prahlad, he actually offers the longest series of prayers of all of them. He starts on 9th verse and goes on almost to 50th verse. So, he right now starts with the mood of humble submission. submission. And the Lord, actually, I could not have done this. How did I do it? Struck with wonder himself. And that mood of submission. Now, normally, a devotee has achieved something special. A devotee certainly has the Lord's mercy. But a devotee desires not just the Lord's mercy. A devotee desires the other devotee's mercy also. Even when the devotee has achieved something special, the devotee thinks, okay, what about others? The devotee doesn't want others to feel bad. Oh, you know, I have proven I am greater than all of you. I am special. No, the devotee's mood is, we all together serve Krishna. And this mood is there, actually, even in the highest pastimes of the Lord. When, uh, in the last Gita, they said all the gopis, they come out and Krishna plays his flute and calls them. At that time, the gopis, they, they, they tell Krishna that the Udgita Mohitaha, that Pati Sutan Vaya Bhratra Bandharan, Ati Vilamhyate Antyakshutagataha. So they said, we left everything and we came to revive with your flute. He just called us, drew us, dragged us. Almost helplessly, Avashraha to it. So initially, Krishna brought the gopis, and then the gopis become proud. That's what is generally said. And then they go, Krishna gives the, it only Radharani. And Radharani becomes proud, and Krishna gives her also. But that the gopis become proud in an external understanding. The internal understanding, Anandavan Champu Kavikarnapu gives. And actually, the gopis, and they're all with Krishna, Radharani, they're thinking, they are all with Krishna. The gopis are very delighted to be Krishna, but they all feel, we know that of all of us, it is Radharani who has the greatest devotion. And therefore, Radharani's glory is actually established. And so, the gopis, they allow, they act as if they are proud, so that Krishna goes along with them. And initially, when Radharani is alone with Krishna, she feels like, Oh, Krishna loves me so much, Krishna is with me alone. But then, she starts thinking, what about Lalita, what about Vishakha? 
and their hearts will be shattered. The Krishna is like, how can I enjoy without Krishna? And so Radha tells Krishna, Krishna, you know, I am tired. I cannot walk any further. Her hope is that Krishna will stop. And the gopis are searching for him, they'll find him. And then they will come back. And then so the gopis are thinking about glorifying Radha, and Radha is thinking about Krishna. So, so here in the same mode, Brahmaji, he doesn't think, I am the I am the progenitor of the whole universe. You know, what can this small child? <laughs> and Prahala, when he is able to do something wonderful, he starts appreciating the money. So this mode of submission is what actually endears the devotee to the Lord very much. And where does the submission come from? Because the devotee is focused on the Lord. The devotee does not need one's own glorification. The devotee is delighted in the Lord's glories. And then, we go to the next verse. Actually, I'm going to, I cannot take all the verses, but I should take the next, the two verses after that. There, I talk about the inversion. So, I want to talk Simma, S-I-M-H-E. Inversion. So, this is 7.9.9, go to 7.9.9, there is now. Viprad Vishadha Gunayita Darvinda Nabha Pada Ravinda Vimukha Chapachamva Rishtam Manyeta Darpita Mano Vachine Hitatha Pranam Punati Sakula Naturi Manaha. So Kalan Maharaj, in this verse, he says that he is raising the question, How was I able to satisfy you? That question, the answer is probing. And he says, Actually, in the intermediate verse, in the in verse that is in between, then first he says, he gives a list of many different devatas, many different devotees who satisfy the Lord. And he says, Bhakta Pito Shibhakavan Gajayutha Paya. And he says, he was satisfied only by Bhakti. And then he gives an example, a dramatic inversion of the social hierarchy. He says, there will be a great Brahmana, Vipra, Vishada, Guna, Yutad. That Brahmana who is ornamented with the 12 qualities of a Brahmana. Those qualities are described by the Prabhupada in his purport. He quotes from the Sanasuja Samhita and describes those qualities. Which is the Guru Yuta, Arvinda Nama. So this Brahmana was who has Brahmanical qualities. But if that Brahmana is <coughs> Vimukhat, Aska, but he is turned away from Arvinda Nama, that Lord who has Lotus Naval. Pada Ravinda Vimukhat. From the lotus root of that Lord, the Brahmana is turned away. Why was the Brahmana turned away? Because of pride. And then, in contrast with that, Shopacham Varishtam Shopacha. Shopacha means a dog, a low class person. Manye Tadarpita Mano Vachine Hitartha. If such a person who is a dog eater, that person is devoted oneself to the Lord. With the, with the body, with the mind, with the words, with the life. So, manye tadarpita mano vachine hitata pranam punati sakulam. Such a person will be able to deliver oneself and one's dynasty. Natubhu imanaha. On the other hand, the Brahmana, the pra, Brahmana is proud, the Brahmana will not be able to deliver even oneself. The speciality of bhakti is that it inverts the conventional hierarchies. The conventional hierarchy is that a Brahmana is considered to be at the top of the social hierarchy. And Shopacha, the object is considered right at the bottom. And this hierarchy is important. But it is based on past karma. Some people by the past karma are born in a higher class family. Some people by the past karma are born in a lower class family. But bhakti is not dependent on what we have done in the past. Bhakti is dependent on what is the state of our heart. And if somebody is trying to devote oneself to the Lord, so although the normal hierarchy would be like this, bhakti inverts the hierarchy. One who is devoted to the Lord becomes greater than even the person who is considered the topmost. In fact, there are seven examples in the Bhagavatam of this inversion of the social hierarchy. And I have a whole, whole seven and a series of talks on this theme. I just give a couple of examples to illustrate this point of how the Bhagavatam declares clearly that bhakti is what is most important. 
So <laughs> the most dramatic example of this comes in the ninth canto, where we have Durvasa Muni, who is he? Who is a sannyasi and a Brahman. And it's contrasted with whom? Who is a Grihastha and a Chitra. Both in the social hierarchy, he is considered lower. But then what happens? Actually, Ambarish Maharaj proves himself with such a great devotee and Durvasa Muni succumbs to his anger. And that Brahmana to whom the Kshatriya offers obeisances, that Brahmana has, Durvasa Muni goes all over the universe. Begging help, he goes to Brahma, he goes to Brahma, he goes to Shiva, he goes to Vishnu. And imagine Vishnu also says, I cannot protect this. If you have appointed my devotee, you can go and ask for him this. And he goes there. And he begs to go to Ambarish. And Ambarish doesn't say, I forgive you. Why do you feel like like this? So actually, you are not committing your duties at all. He's very respectful. So uh, that social hierarchy is completely inverted. Similarly, in the sixth canto, there's the story of Rutrasur and Indra. Rutrasur is a demon, Indra is a Devata. And normally the Vedas and the Puranas are filled with how the Devatas defeat the Asuras. But here, the Asura Rutrasur, who, who turns out to be a far greater devotee than even the Devata who is in us. Not just Devata, it's Devi, the greatest of Devatas. So in our spiritual life, in our bhakti practices, we also may have some particular mental situations which may be unfavorable to bhakti. It, but we should know that there is no material situation that can stop us from practicing bhakti. Mm -hmm. So actually, the Lord himself is always readily available for those who offer themselves with their heart to him. In fact, in the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, from verses 9.20 till 9.33, Krishna contrasts bhakti with other forms of other activities, with, uh, with the bhakti to him, with the worship of devatas. And through four points of comparison, Krishna demonstrates the supremacy, the superiority, the glory of bhakti. So first in 9.2021, he describes how those who worship Devata, they go to Swarga, but they fall back. But on the other hand, those who worship him, he says, Yoga Kshimam Maham. I protect what they have, I provide what they lack. So, which I say the results of any other form of worship are temporary, but worshipping him, the results are eternal. So he talks about the nature of the results first. Then he talks about the 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 facility for worship. He says from Devtas one has to perform elaborate yagyas. So worshipping him, this is Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam Yume Bhaktya. Just a simple leaf, simple fruit, simple flower, just a little water. In fact, Acharya described that Krishna also mentions all these in singular, not in plural. He doesn't say Patrani Pushpani Palani. It's Patram Pushpam Palam. Just one flower, one fruit, one leaf, that's all Krishna asks for. So for Krishna, when we are offering him, it is actually love that is the appetizer. And that we'll talk a little bit later about what is it that attracts Krishna. So, so whatever it is that we may feel, we are not, we're not qualified. Bhakti works it all. Bhakti is actually very subtle. So sometimes, that which will be a qualification in material life, that which will be a qualification even in religious piety, that can become a disqualification in bhakti. So, for example, somebody may have a lot of knowledge. Now, with knowledge, we can fix our mind on the law, but somebody can become proud of their knowledge. And if they become proud of their knowledge, then that very knowledge can become a disqualification. <coughs> Somebody may have a lot of renunciation. With renunciation, one can fix the mind of the Lord undistractedly. Mm -hmm. But if one becomes proud of the renunciation, mm -hmm. then that renunciation can also become a disqualification. <coughs> so sometimes you feel, oh, you know, I'm so fallen, I have this condition, <coughs> I have that attachment, I have this problem, how can I practice? I'm so, I'm so fallen. You know, 
actually, yes, we want to rise, but we, we should know that actually bhakti is so subtle that something, sometimes something which may seem to be like a success may turn out to be a failure in bhakti. Suppose I have some condition, and by the power of my willpower, I have overcome that condition. Now I, think I have given up this impurity, I have become pure. But if that success has come simply by our willpower, and if that makes us proud, yes, see how self control I am. See all these people, yes, of all. I am so proud. Then that's, there may be a success in self control, but a success in self control may be a failure in devotion. Why? Because we have become more self self absorbed, not Krishna absorbed. On the other hand, sometimes there may be a failure in self control, self control. We may be able to we fall to our condition, but if that makes us more dependent on Krishna, Krishna, we should be like, come and do it. Please help me, O oh Lord. Then that failure in self control may be actually a success in bhakti. Now we shouldn't fail in self control if we can't success in bhakti. <laughs> the human mind is so perverse that anything if we take for its own and interpret it for its own purposes. Now we definitely want to be self control We want to be pure. Why? We have to know that actually Krishna has his own ways of purifying us. Sometimes you feel that Krishna, I'm, I'm praying so much, I'm trying so much, but this, this condition is not going. Well. Why is it not going? Actually, Krishna can remove the condition in one moment. But sometimes the condition goes away. It may happen that we will come to the party. So Krishna may not take away the conditioning just so that we don't become proud. And eventually, when the conditioning goes away, we will, we will take a moment and say, actually, it was not I who purified it, it was Krishna who purified it. So eventually, we will get purity along with humility. Now we may get purity, but the purity may take away our humility. And so Krishna may not do it. So there may be, there may be certain disqualifications that somebody may, may have, and somebody else may have some qualifications. But if we focus on bhakti, the principle of bhakti, this try to serve Krishna according to Krishna. Then nothing else matters. So Prahlad Nanasi is over here. That actually the Brahmana, if they are filled with one's own glories, then the Brahmana will not be able to deliver oneself. So Bhakti, in India there is, a, uh, there is in the caste system, and especially in the Western world, uh, whenever India is portrayed, or Hinduism is portrayed, they portray, oh, you have this terrible caste system. Uh, but actually speaking, the Bhakti movement, throughout its history has been strongly protesting against the caste system. In fact, it has been a moment which has actually included everyone. And if we consider, some people ask, why do you support this caste system? We don't support the caste system. Right. You know, rather than demonizing the tradition, we have to see that there was reform from within the tradition itself. And the strongest expression of that reform from within the tradition was not. There may have been modern Indian freedom fighters or modern Indian social reformers who try to who try to counter the caste system and they are often glorified. But even before they came about, within the Indian tradition itself, Bhakti was a tradition of reformation where it protested against the caste system. And the greatest devotees are often people who were from not from the higher caste. In fact, they were persecuted by people from the higher caste. Yeah, the example of Hrindas Thakur also he was persecuted by surely the Muslims persecuted him because of Brahmana's company. So the point is that actually the Bhakti is a tradition which in the world the social hierarchy. And Sri Prabhupada himself, when he came to America, you know, he focused primarily on attracting whoever was attracted, whoever was willing to be attracted, he invited all of them to practice Bhakti. And his idea was that, that actually bhakti is universal, it's for everyone. And Prahlad Maharaj, he himself, he always born in a low family. Now Prahlad Maharaj said, actually, you see all great devotees. He says, no. <coughs> He's talking that it is not my glory that I was able to do this, it is the glory of bhakti that I was able to do this. But then the question may come up does, does this mean Prahlad Maharaj is saying that? No, I am such a great devotee. Okay, I don't have material qualifications, but I have bhakti. And because of that, I was able to. That would imply that other devotees don't have bhakti. 
They don't have bhakti, I have bhakti. So, Prahlad is so humble, he doesn't even take that, that credit. What does he in the next words? He states further, that actually, even if somebody <coughs> worships your Lord, you don't need their worship. Actually, he says, Naivatana Prabhurayam Nijalab Purno Manam Jana Dabhidisha Karuno Vinite So he says that Naivatmana Prabhurayam Nijalab Purno Some people say that you know, God likes to be flattered. People who are devotees, what are you doing? They are flattering the Lord. And when you flatter, the Lord gives you gifts. So actually it is not flattering. The Lord is self-satisfied with you. The Lord has come completely self-satisfied. He doesn't need anything. Naivat mana praburayam nijalao He is completely satisfied with himself. And manam jana davidusha karuno vrinite And if somebody offers him some respect, I will hear it as she could take a flashback. He was actually wanting to be respected. He wanted everybody to not Om Narana Namah. He should be Om Yerani Kashipoyi Namah. Everybody should offer respects to him. That was his desire. And now he got everyone to respect him. But then in his own family, his own son would not respect him. Now there are nowadays people who are you know, people who are workaholics, people are very successful and they go to office and they are bosses and everybody respects them. But when they come back home, they can't manage their own children. So, that is, Irene Kashipu was like that. He was all over the universe, everybody respected him. But he found that Prahlad just couldn't tolerate it. How can my own son not respect me? So, although he had everything in the universe, he was not Nijala He had everything, but still, when he did not have one thing, the one thing he did not have was the son was what offered ready to respect him. Actually, Prahlad respected him. And when his mother, when his, when his teacher, his mother brought him before Hindakash, he offered his respects. But that but he respected Hindakash was his father. Hindakash wanted respect for the Supreme. Hiranyakashi wanted that, you know, that he should be considered the only object of worship. And like in the biblical tradition, they said, Thou shall not worship any other god other than me. So Hiranyakashi had that idea that nobody should worship anyone except me. And therefore, when Prahlad said, What is the best thing that you learn in school? And, and Prahlad, when Prahlad was asked with the Hiranyakashi, he said, The best thing I learned is that actually, we should become devotees of the Lord. Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu Smaranam Pada Sevanam Archanam Vandanam Dasyam Sakhyam Atmani Vedanam Iti Pumsarthita Vishnu Bhakti Shchenana Lakshana Priyeta Bhagavad Gyarda Tanmanye Nita Muttamam This is the best thing that I have learned is we should simply devote ourselves to the Lord. Lord Vishnu by practicing the ninefold process of Bhakti. I mean I wonder actually what was Prahlad trying to do over here? Was Prahlad anyway trying to provoke Hiranyi <laughs> Kashipu? Know, it's like sometimes we know something makes somebody angry. Now we don't speak that. So why was Prahlad deliberately glorifying Vishnu in front of Hiranyi Kashipu? So at one level, Prahlad was simply being honest. He was what is the best thing you have learned? So now, <coughs> Prahlad left out the part in school. He had not learned this in school. <laughs> he had learned this in his mother's womb only. Narada had taught him once. So what is the best thing you have learned? He said, he just honestly told what is the best thing you have learned. Now, later on, when he asked, okay, you know, asked that, he says, when I lift my bluish umbrella, I just lift my eyebrows, my devotas tremble in fear. In front of you, even if I raise my hand, you don't tremble. What is it? No. It's like sometimes if you see, you know, there is a big, uh, big bodybuilder. There's a small child in front. Small child is challenging their bodybuilder. <laughs> and then bodybuilder asks, you know, there's somebody behind you. Otherwise, how are you having such audacity? I can 
I just crush you. So who is there behind you? That, just that question may come also from education to ask, you know, where do you get your strength from? So where do you get your strength from? So he felt, he's my child. It isn't your strength, but he's defying me. He must be getting his strength from somewhere else. Now again, Prahlad, Prahlad gives the most provocative reply. He says, he could have said, my strength comes from Vishnu. What does he say? What does he say? The source of my strength is the same as the source of your strength. Is also the same as the source of the source of your strength. The source of his strength was Brahma and Yunvalish. He said, the source of my strength is the same as the source of your strength and the same as the source of the source of your strength was. That means, what is he doing? He is actually telling Hiranika Shippu, your strength is actually not your strength. So oh, now this outrage is really, I am so powerful, this is my strength. And Pranath is really, this is not your strength. Recently I met uh, Amparish Prabhu, uh, he's a Prabhupada disciple, Alfred Ford. So he tells that for the first time he met Prabhupada. And when he met Prabhupada for the first time, the devotee is introducing him, he's Alfred Ford, he's the great grandson of Henry Ford. Now, now he was used. People, people offering you respect because you're so wealthy, because you're connected with so wealthy. Prabhupada just looked at him straight in his eyes. And then he looked deep and said, Prabhupada, so you're the great grandson of Henry Ford? Where is he now? Where is he now? So, Amrish said that, that time I had to get Prabhupada was a real saint. Where is he now? Means? Prabhupada implied that. You know, he acquired and before got so much wealth, but all that wealth is left behind, he has gone somewhere else. So, Prabhupada saw the soul beyond the body and whatever a person may have had, along with it, that didn't, he didn't bother so much. He did not try to pamper anybody. He just enlightened. And Zambrish was graceful in that. He also saw the intention of what Prabhupada was doing. But actually, you know, as uh, what Prahlad is doing is, he's simply, innocently speaking from the level of spiritual vision. And he's saying, actually, no, Father, even your strength is coming from Vishnu. And he's making a point. He's not simply trying to provoke. The point he's making, it comes in the next verse, my dear Father, actually, don't think. That Vishnu is your enemy. Vishnu is the friend of everyone. It is he, the strength that you have, it is he who has given it to you. Your only enemy is your uncontrolled and misguided mind, which makes you think that someone is your enemy. So he is actually, in his own way, according to your capacity, he is trying to help him. So he, Hiranyakashipu, despite achieving everything, he was not satisfied. He was not satisfied. The Lord, on the other hand, the Lord doesn't need any vigila no. He's satisfied within himself. So the same Lila can be understood at different levels. And Krishna leaves the gopis in the middle of the last Lila. So he has not performed the last Lila. The gopis have just come at that time. And at that time, he is. He's not just talk a few minutes when he leaves them. So the same Lila actually demonstrated at one level the Lord's renunciation. Even he was in the he was in a forest in the middle of night with so many beautiful women. He's left them. He's Mijala. He doesn't need anyone for his satisfaction. If he's reciprocating with someone, that is his is purely a reciprocation of love. So Brahma says that by the Lord. You are fully satisfied in yourself. Manam janan avidusha karuno vrite. So when some people offer him his, their respects, now what is the point? Why do they offer you respects? Actually, they will be offering for whatever reason. You accept because karuno vrite. It is out of your compassion. 
and you accept this respect. And then the Lord's kindness. Krishna, how do you know? So he says, the mood of Prahlad over here is that, my dear Lord, it's not that I have devotion. It is that you are so kind that you accept service from me. Somebody just has a desire to serve you, you accept service from that person. So he is shifting the glory entirely from him to the Lord. The first, first, so although he has achieved something so glorious, first he said, actually I am not glorious, I am no more. Then he says, then how was I able to please you? Because you are the Lord, you are you are the Lord. But, so is it the glory of bhakti and I have bhakti? He says, no. The Lord, you don't even need bhakti. You are actually self-satisfied. People who don't have devotion, you accept service even from them because you are so kind. You are self-satisfied. And this way, that glory which was due to him, he completely transfers to the Lord. That is, so this was, and I'm talking about the, the this is the, <coughs> this is the motivation of the devotee. The devotee is actually simply concerned with glorifying the Lord. The devotee, his motivation is pure. Actually, you know, we may not have purity right now. We may not be pure. But Prahlad Maharaj, the next verse, he says, no. Therefore, my dear Lord, I will glorify you for my own purification. So we should know that actually we may be dis we may be unqualified, but we are never disqualified. We are unqualified in bhakti, but Krishna never disqualifies us. We are always there for the fact. Krishna always opens the doors of devotion for us to come to him. So even if we don't have devotion, we can practice devotion for the sake of purification. Then, then afterwards he moves on. Now he's focusing on the Lord. So a few verses later, he says, and this Lord, the form of the Lord, was so fearful. So it is a fear. It is a fearful form, and then he is completely attracted to this form. And everybody, even the devotees, are afraid of that form. They are offering prayers from a distance. But he says that he found this form as extremely attractive. So, S I M H, which is the Lord's sublime attributes, the attractiveness. What is the attractiveness? He describes the form. Now, how we behave in the day, the Bhyan, the Kasya, Jivharka, Brukuti, Radhaso, Radhaso, Radhamstra, Andras, Raja. So he describes that Naham Vibhemya. I'm not afraid of Lord. Ajitate Ati Bhayavana Kasya is an extremely fearful form. Jivarka. So his eyes, he describes the Lord's eyes are moving like a sword, sweeping around. So furious. Now he is Simha. Simha means a lion. He has the face of a the face of a lion and his tongue coming out like a lion. So he is fearsome. So his sword is his tongue is going like a sword. You mark his eyes were glaring. His eyes were so sometimes the people are angry. Just we look at them and the eyes shrink back and forth. They look so angry. So they were so angry. His eyes were so hot with anger that actually the shine of the sun and the moon. The sign of the sun it appeared pale in comparison. And not only was he angry, his eyes were red, but also along with that, Brukuti. No, he was frowning. Frowning. Frowning that accent causes and it has an unnerving effect. So the Damstra, on top of that, Damstra, Damstra is his teeth were coming out. And Andras Raja is garlanded with an intestine. It's garlanded in the intestine. Now you wonder what is going on over here. Now, how can, now how can uh, the intestine, it's a bloody thing, it's a messy thing. How can, now can the Lord garland himself in the intestine? The Acharya is described that actually when the Lord did a open stomach surgery, 
for Pandandika Shippu. She took out the intestine. What is the reason? She's thinking that actually it is from this intestine that such a wonderful devotee is Pranalad King. So you wanted to see, is there any other Pranalad in this? Any other devotee than Pranalad? That's why you took out the intestine. So there is no other Pranalad. It is this intestine that has actually given rise to Pranalad. So therefore, I consider this intestine very dear to me. And that's why I put the intestine around me. So externally it may appear to be like an act of you know extreme violence. But the same act for the act, act of great affection. Antas Rajaha, Chatakesha, Karanan, his hair. He had a mane of hair rising up. You understand it? And normally whenever the demons and devotas are there, whenever the Lord appears. The devotas are usually, uh, the Lord appears in the incarnation where he is smaller than the Asuras. You know, we have Krishna and we have Ram and Ravana. Ravana is the Rakshasa. Ram, Ram came just in the Manava. Bhamana, he came just in a small form. But Narasimha Dev, he came in a form much bigger, much, much bigger than Viranidashi. He said that when he would shake his head, it was like the clouds would just fly away. Such a big form he was. So, Chamuku. So he had a big mane of hair, and then on top of that, Chamuku. Karana, his hair was completely erect in anger. And then, it's not his ears were completely erect in anger. So then, Naham Vibhenya, but my Lord, I am not afraid of this. Why is he not afraid? Because he is seeing beyond the anger to the love. See, anger can also be an expression of love. Mm. It's only when we care for someone or something that we become angry. It's when we care very strongly about something and that thing is going wrong, then we become angry about it. That means we are strongly emotionally invested in it. So, Prahlad is not just seeing the anger of the Lord, it's also fearsome. Prahlad is saying, why is anger coming? Because the Lord loves me so much. Therefore, he feels no fear at all, no fear at all. What does he feel? He feels affection. Rupam, Natsimha, Vibhaya, Yasmarami. It is Ruchira Rupa. It is a beautiful form. And in fact, he says, when I remember this Lord, I have become free from fear. Not to speak of being fearful, I become free from fear. So that Lord, Natsimha Swami, is Aradhanayu Natsimha. And a beautiful he there is for Potam. He says, so, so the invocation is just as a lioness, she is very fearsome for any hunter who is coming to coming to attack. But for the lioness, for her own cub, she is the embodiment of motherly love and protection. So like that, for the demons, our Nasimhan is very fearful, fear, fearsome. But for the lioness, he is a source of fearlessness. And Prahlad Maharaj is just, this way he sees the beauty of the Lord. At one level, <coughs> Simhadeva's form is not beautiful. It's fearsome. But that fearsomeness, the devotee sees the beauty of the Lord. <coughs> and at last, as we discuss this, so this one handsome A is the aspiration. What does a devotee aspire for? So in the last, so he says, and my Lord, I'm not fearful of your fearsome form, but what am I fearful of? So he says, Trastos me, my Lord, I am afraid, I am afflicted. Krupanavatsala, the beautiful declaration of the glory of the Lord. Normally we hear the Lord as Bhakta, he is the lover of his devotees, but he is a Krupanavats. You are not just the lover of your devotees, you are the lover of even the Krupanas. I will come back to this later. This Ogra, my Lord, I am not able to tolerate this. Samsar Chakra Kadana Grasatam Pranitaha. Samsar Chakra, in the cycle of material existence, I am caught and miserable. Gasatam Pranitaha, I am caught in this. And this, he says, 
we are we eat terrible things and get eaten by terrible things. In samsara chakra, it is jivo jiva se jiva. The terrible struggle at the foundation for existence. And we human beings don't live in a society of cannibals right now. For an animal, the bodily conception is entirely there. So the animals don't understand the soul. And what happens to an animal like an animal like a deer? Now when a lion pounces on it, what does it feel? It's like I am being eaten up. Horrible feeling. Free one self being consumed. So it's a horrible existence of existence. He says, I was born in the Rakshasa family. Rakshasas eat people. So he says, by a past karma, I was born in a family like this. And he said, my dear Lord, I am very afraid of this my existence. But the existence, but that's what karma be. By my own karma, I am not alone. Kushetam teyam yadimulam. What do I want, O Lord, O Supremely? Printo apavar kasharanam vayase kadanu. I said, Lord, when will you call me back to your lotus feet? So the aspiration of his heart is, at one level, he had just fallen the lotus feet of the Lord. He offered his obeisances there. The Lord has placed his hand on his head. But he said, my dear Lord, when will you call me back to me? Tell that aspiration of his heart. He is not exalting in the achievement. Now I have proven my glory to everyone. I mean, everybody has understood how great is my devotion. My dear Lord, when will you call me back to your lotus feet? So a devotee, our, uh, the test of our devotion is how much we long for the Lord. But this world, at one level, can seem to be like a wonderful place. With so many pleasures up there. At another level, it can seem to be like a dreadful place. Especially when we face, suf face sufferings, we face problems, we face miseries. But, you know, the devotee doesn't see the world so much. He only sees the Lord. That it's the Lord whom I want to serve. And how can I come closer to the Lord? When, oh Lord, will you call me? Yeah. Now, of course, how the Lord calls us, He's not just asking for, you know, when will I become liberated from the material existence and I'll attain you? Yes, that is ultimately there. But we see what happens at the end of it all. You know, Nathan offers his prayers, that somebody gives him the full kingdom. So, actually, Prahlad says, My dear Lord, I don't want anything. I don't want anything from you. Prahlad offers all these prayers and then Narasimha uh, says, ask for something, Prahlad. He offers you wonderful prayers. So he says, my dear Lord, I don't want anything. No, ask for something. He says, I'm not a businessman. That I need bhakti so that I could get something from you. He says, no, but it's not a business. It's simply out of affection. I want to give something. So please ask for something. Then Prahlad says, if you want to give me something, then please give me one thing, my Lord. What is that? Please free my heart from the desire to ask for anything. <laughs> <laughs> Please free me from all the selfish desires. So, what happens is, the last desire is, I don't want anything, my Lord. I simply want to get you to speak. But the Lord tells him that you rule the kingdom. On my behalf. So Hiranyakashipu had the kingdom and in one moment everything was lost. So Prahlad says, I have seen with my own eyes that this material prosperity it does not last. To a devotee, if we have material prosperity, we use it in Krishna's service. If we have material adversity, we see it as an impetus for the ancient profession. So in this world, sometimes we will be pull towards Krishna by the good things of this world. <laughs> and sometimes in this world we'll get bad things. And we'll see bad things as we'll be pushed towards Krishna. I mean, some people lovingly say no, I, sometimes you know, some devotees are so wonderful. And we start feeling that you know, why? Oh, so devotees are so nice. How nice Krishna will be. And then what is happening? By their sweetness, by their kindness, we feel Krishna's love and we feel attracted to this Krishna. I want to, I want to go closer to Krishna. But sometimes we find even in the devotee community, devotees may be in some terrible way. <coughs> you know, how can a devotee do like this? 
then seeing that this devotee doing like this, we can see in the same sense, Krishna sometimes pulls me to some devotees, towards him, that's the same Krishna pushes me towards him to some devotees. So rather than blaming those devotees, we can see that actually it's Krishna who is acting. So Prahlad saw it this way, that Narada pulled him towards Krishna by giving instruction, by giving example, <coughs> by giving knowledge. And Hiranyakashipu pushed him towards Krishna. So as devotees, the whole, the, if we are to practice bhakti in this material world, the bhakti requires, the practice of bhakti requires the, <coughs> the requires the consistent reinterpretation of reality. Whatever happens, we need to interpret it in a way that it is favorable for us. So some devotees are kind to us, we see that as actually this is Krishna manifesting his kindness. So if some people are unkind to us, we say actually Krishna can in this world there cannot be any perfect relationships. So there's always going to be creatures. So let me take shelter of you also. So ultimately the Bhagavata and the Prahlad passed in, they were demonstrate. You know, the glory of Prahlad, what was his glory? Sometimes you may hear this kind of pastimes that we may hear. I did not talk about that much. I'm not going to that, but I just mention it. That Prahlad was protected through so much so much persecution. You know, he was <coughs> he was put into practically he was sent from one torture department to another torture department. Nowadays, in the political circles, there is a lot of talk about how torture should not be used as a means of uh, extracting. But Prahlad, uh, you know, he had no time for political correctness. So what he was, he tried to burn Prahlad, he tried to pierce Prahlad, he tried to throw Prahlad down a valley. Now, through it all, Prahlad was protected. So now we may see that that is the miraculous protection of the Lord. But actually, the miraculous protection of the Lord. And you think, okay, that happened to the Lord. What is going to happen to me? I'm not being protected like that. You know, the miraculous protection of the Lord was not just that Prahlad's body was protected. Mm -hmm. The miraculous protection of the Lord was that Prahlad's devotion was protected. Mm -hmm. Even when you know, Prahlad is seen as the embodiment of Smaranam, the nine forms of bhakti, among them Smaranam, remembrance, is one of the ways of practicing bhakti. Prahlad is the embodiment of that. So, what was special about Prahlad Maharaj was not that, that, okay, when he was being thrown down from a mountain, when he was put in the middle of a fire, when he was cast among snakes, at that time, he was protected. Yes, he was protected, that's wonderful, but the speciality of Prahlad was that throughout it all, he was remembering the Lord. And that remembrance of the Lord was the protection. Externally, whether the protection came or not, that doesn't matter so much. The same Bhagavatam, which depicts Prahalad being protected through so many dangers. That same Bhagavatam also depicts that Parikshit Maharaj was not protected by the enemy. The Bhagavatam is you consider as a movie. He starts with declaring that, you know, okay, that's the particular hero, in seven days he's going to die. And at the end of the movie, at the end of the seven days, the hero dies. Hey, what is this? <laughs> Something special should happen. The English should have some miraculous rescue. But that doesn't happen. And Prahlad Parishit Maharaj is cursed to die at the start of the Bhagavatam. <coughs> at the end of the Bhagavatam, he dies. That is the protection. The protection is in absorption. He was absorbed in the Lord, and because of that, the event of that happened at the level of the body. But there was no experience of the trauma of that body because internally he was sheltered in Krishna. So the real miracle in the case of Prahlad was not that his body was protected. Yes, that's a great miracle and we appreciate that. But the real miracle was that his faith and bhakti was protected. And throughout it all, he was always remembering Krishna. So when we are practicing bhakti, when we have problems, you know, often what happens is we, we pray to Krishna. Krishna, please help me. But it is, you know, we have one eye. Is help coming or not? It's like what I do, what I do. Is help coming or not? You know, when Draupadi called out to the Lord, you know, she just raised her hand. She closed her eyes and called out. She was not one eye open. Is something going to happen or not? Completely she something to the Lord. So, like that, when we, if we are practicing bhakti, so 
connecting with Krishna would at another level expect it. Is this problem going to be solved or not? Is this problem going to be solved or not? Then, you know, I'll conclude with this last point. You know, problems should be an impetus towards Krishna. Krishna should be an impetus, not be an impetus towards the problems. That means that problem consciousness should increase our Krishna consciousness. If it has problems, that means this whole itself is a problematic place, let me take shelter of Krishna. But instead, what happens is we are Krishna conscious, but actually we are problem conscious. You know, Krishna, are you solving this problem or not? When you do like that, Krishna can remove the problem, but one problem will go away, another problem will come. That problem will go away, third problem will come. So, the, yes, it's not that Krishna wants us to suffer problems. It's not that our problems are not, we have to deal with the problems. The problems are here. But the ultimate problem is that we are disconnected from Krishna. But if you focus on that, just connecting with Krishna, the nature of life is problems will come, problems will go. So, what we can pray to Prahlad Maharaj to Rene Pratim Nasimhadev on this day, that actually the way Lord Nasimhadev inspired Prahlad Maharaj to become completely absorbed in him, that we may get a fraction of that absorption. If we can be absorbed in the Lord, that absorption itself is the ultimate perfection. And through that absorption, we will get the strength to deal with the problem, to tolerate the problem if it remains. And we will get the intelligence to tackle the problem if it is to be removed. So, that Prabhupada <coughs> demonstrate that principle of absorption in the Lord. And that simply demonstrates his protection, not just through the miraculous way in which he, he protected Prahlad or he gave any question. His protection was through it all he was absorbed. So, actually, you could say, Prahlad's, you know, there is, when there is adversity, it said that, what is that Hindi saying? That when there is, when there is suf suffering, everybody remembers the Lord. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. So thank you. So in distress, you say, in distress, uh, people remember the Lord, but in happiness, nobody remembers. So you think happiness, somebody remembers, then there is no reason. What does it mean? Actually, in distress, so Prahlad, you could say that when Hiranyakashi was persecuting him, at that time, what, he was a five-year-old child, what could he do? He had no alternative, so he remembered the Lord. At that time, he was remembering. But Prahlad's devotion is definitely great at that time also. But now, here, when it is a moment of victory for him, and his devotion is proclaimed by everyone, the Lord is become pleased, he's shown, this is more moment of victory. But even here, he's absorbed in the Lord. So, he is not forgotten the Lord, he is broadcasting his glory. He is remembering the Lord. That is his protection. So, if we can get the inspiration from Prahlad, remember the Lord amidst distress and amidst happiness, amidst failure and amidst success, then that is the surefire way, sure shot way in which we can transcend the misery of this world and be united with the Lord in his eternal blissful world. So, we conclude with the prayer which we offer in the beginning. Let's take a So even when Prahlad has done something glorious, if nobody has done it, he's not filled with his own glory. He's submissive to his elders, to the Lord. And he is not delighted that I have achieved so much. He's amazed. How was he able to do this? How is it possible? So then I was in virgin. Bhakti in words of normal hierarchy. You will be, be disqualified, but if we focus on devotion, we can be qualified. The Bhagavan and Moshe to Sudurvasa and Baish to Indra Vajrasur. And then, similarly, we can focus on the fact that whatever we are situated, just connect with Krishna. I am God's motivation. motivation. The devotee's motivation is, I don't have devotion, but let me practice bhakti. Practice bhakti so that I can get devotion. So I can be purified. 
The Lord, the Lord doesn't need us. The Lord is self satisfied. He gives the opportunity to serve Him, and that is His magnanimity. The Lord shifts the glory. How was I able to satisfy you? My dear Lord, it is so kind. You are so kind that you became satisfied by my words, by my actions. And edge was handsomeness. So although Narsimhade looks fearsome, you go to the anger, Prahlad sees beyond the anger in the affection. And thus, he is that he is not all fear, in fact, he comes free from fear. And thus, we can also when see the essential beauty of the Lord, even when there are problems in our life. That is all aspiration. The devotee aspires not just for happiness and prosperity in this world. The devotee aspires for calling out to the Lord. When will you get into the lotus feet of the Lord? When will I be absorbed in you? So the protection of Prahlad was not that this is life for so various times. Yes, that is definitely miraculous protection. But ultimately, miraculous protection was that his faith was protected. The Lord's ultimate protection is absorption in him. So in failure, in success, if we stay absorbed in him, then we will be ultimately protected. Shinarsan Made Bhagavan Ki Jai Prahlad Maharaj Ki Jai Prabhupada Ki Jai Gaur Bhakti Nandi Ki Jai Gaur Kaiman Ki Jai